this uh, young gentleman uh, who is uh, Dr. Giulio Priese. I think I pronounce it right. Thank you very much. Uh, he is a lecturer in war studies at King's College London now. He received his PhD uh, at the University of Cambridge. And uh, I have the privilege of uh, have met him, uh, was it three or four years ago? I think it was 2011. 2011, yes, uh, while he was still uh, doing his uh, PhD there. So today when we met, we said, we know each other, don't we? <laughs> but uh, obviously he's done a great job uh, in his PhD and produced this uh, beautiful book as a spin off of your, your research. Uh, Sino Japanese power politics is a very important topic. Uh, it is even uh, more important now, the, the uh, President Trump coming into uh, the picture even more than um, uh, President Obama uh, did. Uh, as you may very well know, the regional uh, power politics or the security issues are really sort of uh, heightened now, the danger, I, I would say. But uh, obviously, he is the expert on that uh, particular issue. Uh, so, okay, Dr. Julio uh, Prese, I will hand it over to you. So, thank you. Thank you very much. A few logistical questions. Shall, mm -hmm. I, shall I speak here? Yes, yes, you can. Yes, and then what, when you sit here, that will pick up your voice. Okay, so You don't great. have to read all that information. Uh, go forward with the PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, all this. Thank you. You could, uh, yeah, explain. Thanks. Thank you. Well, before <clears throat> we uh, uh, set up the PowerPoint presentation, I would like to uh, thank you all first for coming and thank Daiwa for the opportunity for uh, uh, present. Um, can you all hear me yes. in the back as well? And um, <clears throat> I would like to. Uh, to, uh, to thank uh, Chiobo for the kind introduction, but also I'd like to warn you that uh, I'm a bit debilitated today. I'm feverish, uh, I, uh, I'm under the influence of medication in this case, and uh, uh, <clears throat> I might take some time to uh, put my thoughts into, <clears throat> into a uh, uh, coherent fashion. And before we, we start, uh, I'd like to to let you know what this book is, uh, uh, the genesis of, it, of this book was, uh, and why is, it, is this book important. This book is important because it's uh, really a picture of uh, Japan-China interaction following the nationalization of three uninhabited islands uh, in the East China Sea, and how China retaliated to the Japanese government's nationalization of these islands uh, through coercive measures to dispute Japan's effective control. Also <clears throat> because China understood Japan's, uh, Japanese government's nationalization as a change of the status quo, thus weakening uh, further even more uh, Chinese uh, uh, claims on the disputed Senkaku and Liu Islands. And I was there in Japan by sheer luck, between September 2012 and September 2014, for my field work, <clears throat> my PhD field work, <coughs> um, on my PhD thesis, which was uh, on a related topic, uh, but slightly different. It was on Japanese foreign policy making uh, under the first Abe administration and other administrations. So it was a mixed blessing, because the people I came to interview just Abe and his foreign policy team came back to power, thus access was much more complicated. But there was an incredible consistency in terms of the Japanese government, the Abe administration's uh, approach towards China, I argue. And this is also one of the points I'm making the PhD, but Abe has consistently pushed for a, a China balancing. And especially at the time of crisis, <coughs> Japan's China balancing, the sort of uh, military diplomatic balancing uh, of China's rise, has taken new momentum and ventured into uncharted territories such as economic statecraft. So the state using uh, strategies to contain China's rise 
or to defend itself and maintain its political leverage also through economic means and also through communication efforts. And this is the most important, uh, arguably the most original part of my research. And this is a spin-off uh, of my <coughs> PhD, which is on a different subject. It's a more of a historical reassessment and a study of policy making. And this comes really by interacting with uh, 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 Japanese academics, uh, journalists, uh, uh, policy makers, and seeing the new direction of Japan's China policy was what I was doing field work. Interestingly enough, my colleague Aurelio Inciza, a fellow Italian now at Lingnan University, agreed that China was also pushing the envelope in a new uh, fashion and with a newfound dynamism and proactivism. And we agreed that this made a very interesting subject for a short study. And hence, this, uh, this is the story of the book. And the book is of topical importance because it deals really between, of, uh, with the competition and the sort of standoff uh, on multiple levels between this, the world's second and the third largest uh, economies. So it is of uh, fundamental importance, not just for regional, but also for global uh, peace and prosperity. <clears throat> so I will outline very briefly uh, today's, uh, uh, today's uh, talk. I'll, I might blab for uh, a while too longer because it, it will take time to, to focus. But uh, <clears throat> um, I'm very happy to go into deeper details uh, of some of the aspects we will touch upon uh, because time is short. Uh, first of all, I will uh, uh, highlight the main contribution of the study. And as, it will make, as, a, as, a, as I will try to make clear, my study is uh, embedded uh, in uh, the international relations theory of realism, specifically neoclassical realism. And I will show what does it mean to look at Sino-Japanese interaction through the broader logic of neoclassical, of neoclassical realism in a second. Because it makes much more sense to contextualize, really, the Japan-China <coughs> contest over the disputed Senkaku Diaoyu Islands within the broader logic uh, of the power transition that is undergoing uh, in uh, East Asia, as China's clout uh, is on the rise, and uh, Japan, and to a lesser extent, the United States of America, uh, are declining relative to China's uh, influence. And then <clears throat> I will try to keep it uh, empirical and uh, uh, particularly grounded in uh, uh, easy to access ana analysis, as I do in the book, I will uh, dig deep into what, is, uh, what has been the military diplomatic uh, efforts uh, of, of Japan. This is the first section. In the second section, I highlight the realist logic be behind uh, Japan and China's efforts at the economic level. And this is fascinating, because Economic initiatives have been advanced uh, with not just political aims in mind, but also geopolitical aims. And this is also a new fascinating subject uh, um, and uh, arguably an original uh, aspect of the book. And lastly, <coughs> since it's uh, 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 the most novel aspect of Sino-Japanese interaction, I will uh, dig deeper into a sort of communication standoff between these two proud uh, uh, powers. And <clears throat> before I go further, before I move further, I argue that Japan and China have been embroiled into a propaganda race, uh, where both states have competed uh, for the hearts and minds of both domestic and international audiences uh, to showcase resolve uh, and to <clears throat> show how righteous their stances on the disputed islands were, and conversely to denounce the counterpart. So the logic is inherently zero sum. But before we go further, I'd like to have a, a, a word on the use of the word propaganda. Propaganda <laughs> comes actually from uh, Rome, where I come from. <laughs> to, the extent, to the extent that there is a propaganda street in Rome, right next to the Spanish steps. <laughs> um, because the um, uh, congregation for uh, the uh, uh, 
evangelization of peoples, I need to get the English right, was established by the Catholic Church in 1622 to uh, uh, make sure that Protestantism didn't uh, <coughs> move any further and that uh, the new territories uh, uh, in the Americas and Asia would actually be converted, uh, the people of these uh, lands would be converted to, to, uh, uh, to Catholicism. This is uh, the headquarters uh, of uh, uh, the congregation, which is right next uh, to, to the Spanish Steps. And it's a beautiful, uh, big building designed by Bernini. Um, and in Italy, in Italian, the word actually has uh, a relatively neutral stance, a, a, a relatively neutral nuance. It doesn't necessarily have a critical um, definition as it does in the common usage of English. And thus, in my book and in this presentation, what I define as propaganda is really just a purposeful uh, use, um, uh, systematic form of purposeful persuasion that attempts to influence emotions, attitudes, and actions on information and messages that may or may not be truthful. So my definition is quite clinical, <clears throat> and it borders really with uh, what, in, what academics would define strategic communications now. <clears throat> um, which is, uh, as I understand, uh, a British understatement for propaganda. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, perhaps this is uh, my cynical Italian mind speaking. Um, and so, uh, propaganda has, uh, in this uh, particular definition, betrays the active role uh, of uh, uh, a specific agent uh, that makes uh, purposeful use of information and messages for its own aims. And in this case, uh, I claim that propaganda has been used uh, uh, actively by states <clears throat> to shape the narratives uh, of uh, their own state identity vis-a-vis -vis the counterpart. And so my claim is really against, if you want, uh, uh, the standard uh, area studies approach to international relations, which looks at a bottom-up approach, where um, China or Japan scholars would look at uh, discourses that are found uh, in textbooks, uh, museums, uh, the media, to try and, uh, and draw the contours and the borders of Japanese or Chinese identity vis-a-vis -vis the counterpart. And so history <coughs> here figures prominently. The scars of history in, uh, um, in China are so prominent uh, uh, that <coughs> the uh, uh, never forget national humiliation becomes uh, uh, embedded in the Chinese national psyche. On the other side, uh, in my book, uh, we claim uh, that state actors have actively capitalized uh, on this already fertile soil, uh, we don't deny it, to up the ante and to insist uh, on an antagonistic uh, narrative uh, vis-a-vis uh, the counterpart. To give you an example on the very specific example of China, it is only in 2014 that the Chinese authorities institutionalized the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Day. And it's from the top down that this happens. It's only in 2014 that the Chinese authorities decide to uh, uh, celebrate uh, the Victory Day against Japan on September 3 through a goose-stepping military parade in front of Tiananmen, uh, in, 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 in Tiananmen Square, in Chang'an Avenue. And as we will see, there are similar instances of new <coughs> uh, initiatives uh, from the Japanese government, uh, from the top, uh, from the top down. And so the role of a nation state should be uh, uh, underscored, not least because of the political capacity that the nation state has, especially in the times of crisis, uh, to, uh, to spread, to propagate, this is the etymology of propaganda, to propagate its own discourses within the national polity and uh, also the foreign, uh, foreign, and also foreign audiences. And as I will show, the logic is dictated uh, by, also by, by power politics because it showcases uh, resolve uh, vis a vis Now, before we move forward, I would like to give you a very brief, brief, uh, picture of uh, the uh, uh, 
So in Cambodia, we will dispute between Japan and China. We will focus solely on uh, China and, and Japan and leave Taiwan on the side today. <coughs> but basically, the in Cambodia, you islands are a set of eight uh, <coughs> islands and uh, uh, island islands that are uninhabited, are <coughs> in the middle of the East China Sea, and uh, they have been uh, acquired uh, through a secret incorporation act. Uh, in January of 1895 uh, by Japan during the, uh, during the final tumultuous uh, stages of the first uh, Japan-China war. So Japan acquired these islands uh, not through the peace treaty of Shimonoseki but through a secret act of incorporation which by the way has never been made, has never made uh, public yet, hasn't been made public. Uh, and it has done so, arguably, also in light uh, of uh, the restraint that the Japanese authorities have shown prior to the first sino Japanese war. Because they were afraid of Chinese reaction to an incorporation of these uh, uh, faraway islands of Qing China. And so to a certain extent, Chinese historical claims on these islands are stronger than Japan. The problem is, uh, <clears throat> for China, that Japan's claims uh, are much stronger through the prism of international law. Because Japan has maintained uh, effective control of these islands uh, since 1895. Um, if we exclude also a parenthesis of uh, trusteeship uh, uh, to the United States, but this trusteeship uh, has worked precisely because of Japan granting authority over Okinawa and the Senkakus to the United States at San Francisco in 1951. Now, China has a much weaker claim uh, on the basis of international law, and arguably in general, also because it has actually acquiesced uh, to uh, the Japanese uh, effective control in the 1920s, uh, a Chinese consul in Nagasaki actually thanked the Japanese government for a couple of, uh, for uh, rescuing uh, Chinese citizens stranded on the Senkaku Islands. And even in the post-war period, in the 1950s, the uh, People's Daily, <coughs> the, which is China's Communist Party's official newspaper, uh, mentioned the Senkaku as Japanese territory. In 19 uh, uh, until 1970, Japanese, uh, Chinese textbooks also recognized uh, the Senkaku as, as Japanese. Or, and Japanese, uh, Chinese textbooks and, uh, and geographical uh, maps. And so it's only when the uh, United Nations agency finds uh, the possibility, the high possibility of rich oil and gas resources that China and Taiwan starts, start to dispute uh, uh, Japanese sovereignty over this set of faraway islands in the East China Sea. But Japan has maintained uh, effective control and it has also <coughs> agreed with China to shelve the dispute uh, in the face of uh, the need to uh, mm. normalize relations in 1972. But this <coughs> agreement between uh, the Japanese and Chinese governments to shelve the issue for further gen future generations to solve it uh, has came into uh, contestation in the 1990s, but especially in the 2000s, as China has uh, uh, tried to dispute Japanese effective control. As early as 2008, the Japanese uh, Chinese uh, People Liberation Army ship transited in the Senkaku Diaoyu territorial waters for nine hours for the first time to, uh, to dispute uh, Japanese sovereignty there. What is interesting is that in 2010, the arrest of an intoxicated Chinese uh, fisherman responsible for uh, venturing in disputed uh, waters, which were under control of the Japanese, <coughs> would uh, respond to Japanese Coast Guard ships by ramming them twice. And the Japanese Coast Guard ships then would arrest the fishermen and <coughs> would uh, uh, eventually uh, take them into custody <coughs> for future prosecution. Interestingly enough, and this is the creeper to our story today, Chinese authorities back then uh, 
showcase the active resolve, uh, not just uh, through uh, diplomatic countermeasures, that implied uh, cancelling meetings and whatnot, but also economic countermeasures, economic retaliation. And this is where the Japanese government, specifically Abe, that wasn't in power yet, uh, learns about uh, uh, Chinese sticks, economic sticks uh, for political gains. So many scholars agree that China embargoed the exports of uh, rare earth materials that were very much needed for uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, manufacturing companies, and also arrested uh, some uh, Japanese citizens that were allegedly taking pictures of uh, a uh, restrict, uh, of restricted access in China. What is interesting is that the Chinese, the Japanese government under the well-intentioned DPJ, Democratic Party of Japan administration, backed down. They backed off, and arguably this reinforced uh, Chinese uh, authorities' uh, appreciation of their leverage vis-a-vis -vis Japan. And this leads us uh, to the story of 2012. These lines are the incursions of Japanese, uh, of Chinese ships, uh, respectively, in the contiguous zones and the territorial waters uh, of, uh, of the Senkaku Ryu Islands. And it's in 2012 that China starts sending massive uh, amounts of uh, official vessels and then eventually also <clears throat> aircraft, such as drones, to dispute Japanese effective control. What is interesting is that when Abe comes to power, he refuses to recognize the existence of the dispute, and in fact uh, responds in kind to uh, Chinese retaliation by showcasing uh, a kizento shitataido, a resolute approach. And it would do so not just through enhancing its military alliance with the US, the quest. This is interesting. Japan has, is now in 2012 uh, aiming to deepen the US-Japan alliance in the face of Chinese coercive measures. But it will also try to uh, enlarge its uh, security partnerships, uh, but also venture into the uncharted waters of uh, <coughs> economic uh, uh, statecraft uh, and, uh, informa and, communication, uh, and communication firepower, boosting its uh, communication firepower. Now, why is it that China has uh, uh, pursued a much more assertive, some would say aggressive, uh, stance vis-a-vis -vis Japan? Well, we need to take a broader uh, view of uh, the structural uh, uh, factors behind uh, Chinese foreign policy and uh, look at so-called structural realist uh, the structural realist picture, which is premised uh, on the balance of power, really. In this case, a balance of threat between uh, the uh, between uh, China and other great powers in the region. And the most important relationship in the region is the one between China and the United States of America. In the book, we argue that the United States of America, notwithstanding the uh, pivot to Asia sloganeering of the Obama administration of boosting its military presence, its diplomatic and economic presence towards East Asia, has actually been quite hands-off. And China has seen and has understood the US as a paper tiger. And this is the reason why Japan, this has kindled Japanese insecurities. You see a conservative think tank, uh, the o Ocean Policy Research Foundation under the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, which has published uh, a, a number of uh, uh, research uh, publications, such as this one, concerned with uh, China's advancement into the seas. And you see that this is basically <coughs> Asia turning red with uh, a, a big dragon uh, uh, coming from the waters. <coughs> and this uh, threat perception has been kindling uh, the insecurities and has also kindled uh, the uh, uh, forceful uh, foreign policy of uh, leaders such as uh, Abe and Xi. And so, to give you a sense of what then a neoclassical realist uh, approach is, you take the structural realist uh, uh, assumptions, and so the US-China balance and how China has behaved much more aggressively, and you translate this uh, picture into uh, uh, the actual uh, perceptions of state leaders 
in this case, and how they have appreciated the broader international structure. Xi Jinping in particular, I will show, has appreciated uh, the military vacuum as uh, a possibility to enhance uh, and to boost Chinese uh, core uh, interests uh, in the East and China Sea, uh, in the East and South China Seas. And Abe as well has understood uh, this uh, structural picture as uh, emboldening China. And in order to deter China, Abe needed to, <coughs> to, uh, to, uh, to enhance Japan's security profile, not <coughs> just at the military level, but also in other chessboards. And this is uh, the foreign policy outlet, out, uh, output. Now, what I do in the book, uh, <coughs> uh, this is uh, really part of my PhD thesis. And I don't go deep into the book, but I mention it. There is a Pacific <coughs> Affairs uh, article coming up very soon. And there is a Pacific Review article, which is already available. And I show how policymaking works under Abe, because I claim that Abe has been Japan's Nixon. Abe has behaved as some sort of presidential prime minister, uh, <clears throat> but has appreciated a strategic realpolitik that uh, didn't uh, take into consideration uh, the consensus building uh, within uh, the Japanese uh, bureaucracies. This has been the traditional approach to studies in Japanese foreign policy making. It, it was all about consensus, it was all about uh, uh, nemawashi, so to speak, and uh, coming up uh, with a shared uh, foreign policy uh, output. In Japan's case, uh, you see, in fact, uh, a, personal, a, a personalized bond between the prime minister's office uh, and uh, a series of uh, cherry-picked uh, bureau bureaucrats, such as Yachi Shodaro. And what is absolutely fascinating is that uh, the core foreign policy executive of the first Abe administration is exactly the same of the second one. And so you have uh, Yachi, who was then the most important diplomat in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs during the first Abe administration. He is now nas Japan's national security advisor, Japan's first national security advisor. And given his preference for strategy, geopolitics, and secret diplomacy, I have labeled him Japan's Kissinger. So if you need to Google something, it's coming up soon. It's a paper called Japan's Kissinger. It's going to be out there. Thank you. I'm happy to send you a copy if you email. And they have, uh, <clears throat> uh, as I claim, uh, they have a very shared belief in uh, you know, a need to recover Japan's great power status, uh, um, a strong suspicion of China's advance into the sea, into the seas, uh, and a preference for for uh, for China balance. And this will suffice for the moment. And also a preference for a, president, a presidential foreign policy approach. This is important because it is exactly the same uh, uh, aspect and trait of the Xi Jinping administration. You might say that the Xi Jinping administration was forced uh, in the face uh, of a uh, uh, tumultuous leadership, leadership transition in 2012 uh, to wear the mantle of nationalism and to as the Chinese say, to ride the tiger of nationalism. But as it's more and more evident, uh, the centralization of power under Xi, and the very fact that Xi, like Abe, is extending uh, the political boundaries of his mandate to become core leader possibly for more than two mandates, the canonical two mandates in the Chinese, uh, in the Chinese Communist Party, like Abe is extending his mandate to become uh, uh, prime minister until 2021, thus extending the, the internal rules within uh, the ruling party. He also has a preference uh, then for uh, military means uh, as a tool of statecraft. Uh, because by virtue, if you see C uh, as centralizing power now, and you still see it an assertive Chinese uh, foreign policy, you need to make the necessary assumption that Xi Jinping himself is a nationalist. He is not using nationalism instrumentally. He is a nationalist and he's also a believer, also because of his strong ties with the PLA, of the military as a tool of statecraft. <clears throat> and uh, this, uh, in fact, uh, see what is interesting is the first uh, Chinese leader that hasn't been uh, decided uh, by Deng Xiaoping, and in fact is the first leader that has enshrined a new 
uh, strategy, if you want, an approach, foreign policy approach uh, uh, towards the world, which is striving for achievement, achievements, which uh, outgrows, if you want, uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, Bismarckian uh, moderate foreign policy of biding China's time because it wasn't ready yet, because it wasn't powerful yet. And so he embodies a new zeitgeist that if you want in China and the world that wants to push and is more confident of pushing China's weight around to secure Chinese interests. And so <clears throat> China, China goes all in and then and, and, and Japan uh, tries to respond uh, in kind uh, in what uh, I have labeled uh, the, or we have labeled the Senkaku Dioyu power games at the military diplomatic, uh, economic, and information uh, levels. <clears throat> the first step uh, to reiterate the point and the validity of our approach uh, is for both the Japanese and Chinese leaderships uh, to concentrate power and to streamline uh, the decision making uh, and make it more presidential so that they have more say in uh, foreign uh, policy making. And I have tried, we have tried to build up uh, this uh, uh, simple uh, outline that tells you really how interestingly the two sides are actually mirroring each other. They're almost duplicating each other. They're, 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 they are uh, <coughs> dancing together for all, uh, for all initiatives in a sense. You have a National Security Commission. We can uh, go a bit further uh, in the Q&A of what, we, what this really means in China. And you have the equivalent in Japan. <clears throat> you have Japan's first national security strategy in December of 2013, uh, co-written by, uh, by Yachi. And you, also, and you also have a new set of security legislation which is ongoing, such as the conspiracy bills that are being under discussion in Japan as, as we speak. And interestingly enough, uh, to streamline uh, uh, the foreign policy machine and to more carefully control uh, uh, Chinese activities in the East and South China Seas, uh, China, specific to the East China Seas, tries to restructure the state oceanic administration, basically uh, China's uh, coast guards. And uh, because of time constraints, uh, I cannot go into details in the might and money sections, but please do ask questions. What, I, what we see uh, as gaining much more momentum in China is uh, balancing of the internal kind, that is China that enhances its uh, military capabilities, not just in terms of military spending <coughs> devoted to the Penal Liberations Army uh, budget and procurement, but especially in terms of militarizing uh, its constabulary forces. Basically, the Coast Guard ships, the police forces uh, uh, in the East China Sea are now actively used uh, for contesting uh, Japanese effective control. And what is interesting is that uh, China is now making use of uh, former PLA ships. The Coast Guard ships uh, tonnage is absolutely stunning now, if you see. They have increased uh, enormously. And you also have, uh, uh, since uh, the end of 2015, a new development. That is that they have, some of these new ships uh, don't have water cannons anymore. They have uh, fire guns. So this is a very scary development, because it's true that we are still lucky that the contestation in the East China Sea does not involve uh, uh, the military uh, side of both China and Japan, but we have uh, the opposite process of uh, a militarization of the police forces. And Japan is responding in kind, not least because Japan's Coast Guard ships uh, budget uh, can actually be increased uh, without taking into consideration the much vaunted ceiling uh, that Japan has of 1% to GDP. It's an informal rule in Japanese politics that Japan's military budget cannot go further 1% to GDP. That doesn't uh, touch at all uh, the uh, budget for its uh, uh, Japanese coast guard. On the Japanese side, uh, so apart from the a constabulary arms race, you could say, you have uh, <clears throat> an approach that looks especially at deterrence uh, from uh, 
the um, alliance side, from, the, the side, from what we call external balancing, that is balancing through uh, deepening Japanese partnerships and alliance with the United States of America. And you see a remarkable consistency with the other administration. In the first, you have the arc of freedom and prosperity, which is basically relabeled as the Asian Democratic Security Diamond in 2012. This was crafted by Yachi and his foreign policy team in both instances. And now goes by the name of foreign policy that takes a panoramic perspective of the world. But basically, it is, <clears throat> as you can visually see, it is, an, it, it is aiming at uh, at uh, uh, curbing China's rise by building a series of strategic partnerships, uh, especially with India, Australia, and the United States. Um, but also by, as we will see, enhance Japan's economic presence uh, in Southeast Asia and beyond. The most important uh, uh, aspect uh, for uh, this section has been uh, the uh, new guidelines in 2015 between the US and Japan, where Japan finally convinced the Barack Obama administration to uh, uh, deepen the US-Japan alliance uh, to also cover um, <clears throat> uh, the great zone scenarios. And also, in 2014, uh, President Obama finally makes uh, a statement to the effect that the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands fall uh, into the US-Japan uh, uh, alliance. Mm -hmm. What is interesting here is that the United States of America is more hands-off than you would expect. Japan has a much more China balancing uh, <coughs> approach than the United States of America. So you would expect the US as being uh, particularly forceful and uh, willing to, to push for a confrontational policy vis-a-vis -vis China I argue that specific to the East China scene, Japan is actually, if you want to use a colorful expression, uh, the tail that aims to wipe the dog. And uh, it does so uh, at the military level, <coughs> and it does so also, uh, in, 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 as you can see, at the TPP level. Japan is much more interested in uh, pushing for geoeconomic initiatives than, for instance, this uh, administration. And of course, the implicit aim is China. Now, why is this important? Uh, well, the logic here, I'll try to make it very short, uh, is, uh, is very, it's very, it's very uh, straightforward. Uh, economic might uh, translates into political leverage. And uh, China, by virtue of being uh, the most important economic actor in East Asia, will develop further and further economic asymmetries vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors and translate those economic asymmetries as political leverage. You are seeing uh, this already <clears throat> uh, in uh, China's relations vis-a-vis uh, -vis South Korea, as China pushes its economic weight around uh, to convince South Korea of not deploying uh, a uh, <clears throat> missile defense system in its soil. And so China would retaliate by curbing Chinese tourists, tourists to South Korea, by curbing Chinese Korean uh, pop. Uh, the K-pop uh, uh, concerts in China, or uh, uh, the um, business uh, uh, of uh, specific uh, Korean, uh, <coughs> Korean enterprises such as Lotte, are now by chance going uh, 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 extensive scrutiny by Chinese authorities. The same has applied uh, to the standoff between China and the Philippines in the Scarborough Show, where China has embargoed the imports of uh, bananas from the Philippines. And interestingly enough, you see really Chinese economic leverage playing also as far away as, as Europe, where European countries, and I've been said also by European diplomats, uh, some European countries have been very cautious in uh, pushing uh, for a uh, denouncing words on Chinese coercive measures in the East and South China Seas precisely because of uh, the economic link with China. And so this becomes especially important for Japan because economic uh, leverage translated to political and geopolitical clout. And so the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, becomes a shield. This multilateral free trade agreement would have fostered then 
a deeper uh, economic uh, uh, partnership uh, with strategic states, but also with some Southeast Asian nation, which, absent TPP, would have more easily capitulated, uh, uh, you might say, or sided with China. And the same logic applies to Chinese uh, geoeconomic initiatives. <clears throat> and it's interesting that a Japanese negotiator by the name of Suzuki, Hideo, I think is his name, published a book, a leading Japanese negotiator to the TPP, where he has made clear that uh, it was the Abe administration and the Senkaku Neo U crisis that has prompted uh, Abe's embrace of the TPP solely for strategic reasons. So, really, the economic rationale here comes uh, <clears throat> is secondary to the political one, or the geopolitical one. The other interesting uh, game that Japan has played uh, on the economic level has been uh, its uh, <laughs> overhaul of economic, uh, official development assistance, that is, aid to developing countries for geopolitical purposes. <coughs> so the biggest recipient uh, of Japanese aid now is India. More interestingly, what Japan gives us aid now are used Coast Guard ships to li the likes of uh, Vietnam, uh, the Philippines, and so on, and to build the capacity building. So really, the aim is to counter China also through uh, uh, this uh, particular aspect. Now, uh, how long do I have left? Uh, that's good. Okay. So now uh, you might uh, say that this is the most colorful section, the most inter interesting section. I'm happy to take questions on the other two sections. But I try to, as you see, advance uh, the same uh, <coughs> narrative throughout this presentation. It's realism with a counterpart in mind, power politics, political aims, strategy. But apart from that, uh, you really have uh, government actors uh, such as the Japanese Prime Minister's office or uh, the Chinese leadership uh, being in control of these initiatives. And the same applies uh, to the information, uh, <coughs> to the information, uh, you might say, offensive of uh, both the Chinese and Japanese governments. Now, there are basically two mirroring uh, narratives uh, <coughs> on the Japanese and Chinese side. Basically, the first two points are exactly the same and mirror-like, where Japan or China is painted as a peaceful country that is being confronted by an aggressive counterpart. And the aggressive counterpart uh, is not challenging just uh, Japan or China's uh, claims, but it's also challenging uh, 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 the status, the international status quo. So to give you an example, Japan <coughs> has advanced the Japanese government under the Abe administration in both administrations for the first time under the first Abe administration, has pushed for this narrative of Japan as, as uh, uh, a beacon of democratic values and universal values, and more recently of uh, the international rule of law, which is being confronted by a country that is disputing this very international uh, <coughs> Uh, rules of the game. And the same applies to China. China has claimed that it is now being confronted uh, for the first time uh, only in recent years by a Japan that is denying uh, the results of the world anti-fascist world, uh, anti-fascist war of World War II. So basically they're saying the same, exactly the same thing. Japan is claiming to act as a defender of uh, <coughs> the liberal order and China as well. The third narrative is a bit different. China claims uh, that it's being confronted by a historical revisionist Japan. And Japan claims that it's being confronted by an unlawful autocratic China. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing about Chinese narratives, strategic narratives, and this is the reason why I say strategic, is that they're being used not just domestically, but also for geopolitical aims internationally. And Chinese authors have been explicit of the need to drive a wedge between the US and Japan by using the history card. And so by painting Japan as a historical revisionist power, you drive a wedge between uh, uh, the US that has fought with China in World War II and uh, seemingly unrepentant Japan. 
but also you try to cement uh, uh, relations with South Korea. And this has been the case for two years, at least, between Xi Jinping and Park Geun-hye, actually three years. Well, <coughs> interesting thing about uh, uh, <coughs> the Japanese case is that you get a simplification of the message also in Japan's case. Uh, because Japan, China has actually been very careful in not going uh, contravening the international rule of law specific to the East China Sea. And there are instances where Chinese uh, actions that do not contravene international law have gained publicity by Japan. The Japanese government has pushed for these uh, denunciations. And of course, the most uh, notable uh, <coughs> antagonistic narrative is the Voldemort one that has been played uh, in London. So I won't go further into, into this. Uh, into this uh, you, you might know uh, the, how the two ambassadors is skirmished in, in uh, Newsnight, as well as uh, uh, editorializing um, in uh, early 2014. Now, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, narratives uh, do come also from a blueprint <coughs> that touches upon the decision making of both countries. and. It, it's harder and more opaque to, to understand how this works in China. <coughs> but there is a very interesting editorial by a, <coughs> an important academic uh, who works at the, at the Chikar, Chinese, uh, the, I don't remember, International Center, I don't remember. But it's uh, a Communist Party affiliated uh, think tank. Uh, and all of what have been, I have told about today, including geoeconomic statecraft, is actually enshrined into this very short uh, commentary, including uh, <coughs> The political use uh, of information for uh, uh, political gains. Um, interesting that the Japanese first ever national security strategy also touches on the need to boost Japan's information for domestic and international audiences. And it makes it explicit uh, that the prime minister <coughs> office acts as a control tower to shape uh, uh, the strategy, uh, the information strategy. Specific to Japan, because it's my focus, uh, what is fascinating and points uh, at the active uh, role of the state uh, in shaping uh, these discourses is that the publicity, according to the Senkaku dispute, uh, gains new momentum under the Abe administration. Uh, he sets up uh, within uh, the uh, Prime Minister's Office premises, an advisory panel on communications concerning territorial integrity. What is fascinating here is that uh, the expert committee debates uh, solely the territorial dispute between Japan and China and Japan and South Korea. Why is that the reason? Because Japan wants to make a compromise uh, with Russia on the uh, Northern Island. And what is very interesting is that the very first uh, territory in Japan to have been labeled uh, an inherent territory, in Japanese it's uh, no Yodo, have actually been uh, the disputed territories with Russia. In 1970, the Japanese government claims that the Hopo Yodo, the southern uh, Kuriles, are Japan's inherent territory to gain leverage vis-a-vis -vis Russia and to increase uh, its uh, narrative, its irredent irredentist narrative. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, uh, Russia falls out of the picture because Japan wants to drive a wedge between Russia and China. And this is explicit in Yachi's uh, uh, book of memoirs, that Japan wants to drive a wedge between Russia and China and is ready to make a compromise on that specific territorial dispute. So you see that territorial disputes are not uh, rock solid uh, as constructivists would say, that you know you have this identity of Russia-Japan enmity of these islands are ours, we cannot make compromises. If the strategic goal for the Japanese government is actually to balance China, the Japanese government is ready to just ignore the other territorial dispute. And <coughs> interestingly enough, the new educational <laughs> guidelines uh, <coughs> of 2015 make explicit uh, <coughs> that the textbooks and, uh, uh, of different schools uh, need to make explicit, I'm trying to cite verb, verb, uh, verbatim, that the Senkaku Islands are Japan's inner territory. So you see, Japan's actually 
makes its uh, position on the Sekakus more rock solid while bending, if you want, and uh, <coughs> making more malleable its position on the on the sample grid. And this points at uh, the importance of realism here. And then, what is interesting here is that you see, both in Japan and China, new efforts uh, are working through uh, <coughs> research journals uh, to 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 actually promote them in both Japanese and English to push for research that is actually helpful for the cause of the government. And so there is a, uh, a research outlet in Japan called Review of Island Studies, where Japanese uh, academics mostly publish articles that reinforce Japanese claims. And interestingly enough, even in Review of Island Studies, there is scant reference to the Salmon Kuriyots. This points, again, at the political logic. And by the way, uh, I cite uh, a, uh, an interview of uh, <clears throat> an editor at a translation company, a major one, that makes clear that the Prime Minister's office has pushed for translations of, uh, this, uh, of this journal into English. <clears throat> the same applies to China. Now, the other interesting thing about the reason why Japan reinforces its narrative, uh, antagonistic narrative, uh, um, is Another realist reason, and that is to legitimize the highly contested uh, security bills. Here you see Japan, uh, Japan's uh, pacifist Article 9 breaking uh, uh, Abe's attempts at uh, revising its, uh, uh, the Constitution with uh, all sorts of protests. And here you see a Chinese dissident living in Japan, a very famous one. He uh, uh, draws cartoons for Newsweek Japan enshrining very carefully and very, very, very brilliantly what I claim is the logic, the other logic of uh, uh, the Japanese government publicity uh, uh, of Chinese actions and its antagonistic narratives. And that is the, uh, the, the need to legitimize the highly contested security bills. And so these protesters don't see the broader picture, that is uh, Godzilla hiding uh, behind the clouds, that is China and, uh, and Kim Jong-un. And then, of course, uh, uh, the uh, other aspect is the international one. We can go further into details here. What is interesting here is to see that there has been booming expenses on both sides. Uh, you also see, and we show, the mobilization of Chinese communities in the UK, uh, in, in Australia, through the efforts uh, of uh, uh, local authorities, uh, the embassy, in all likelihood, and although it's very hard to see to see the, uh, uh, the government's hand here. And then you see also cultural diplomacy initiatives such as China's participation in the London Book Fair with displays of uh, documents of the Diaoyu Islands. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, Japan, acting on the very insecurity of Chinese efforts at the information level, has boosted, really with the Abe administration, its budget by 300%, and it was already considerable. It has set up a new office within uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and it's going to start the Japan House. <coughs> Interestingly enough, this was started in 2014 with no clear plan. It was a rough, it was a, a rushed up, uh, it was a rushed up uh, uh, initiative. And my argument is that it was rushed up precisely because of uh, the information scramble, if you want, between Japan and China. And what is even more interesting is that you see an information scramble happening also in South Korea, where recently, only two years ago, laws have been passed to push for public diplomacy and uh, inform information dissemination. And this actually affects also us vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, if you want, in a different kind of context. What is interesting in the Japanese case is that uh, the Prime Minister office has been in command. Now, to wrap it up, why is this all important? Well, it's important because it's, uh, it's ongoing. And the power games are ongoing, even if the Senkaku Dioyu standoff uh, has actually quietened down. The two governments haven't agreed yet <coughs> to a hotline. And there is a connection between the East China Sea and the South China Sea, as Japan and the US push a bit in confronting uh, Chinese uh, expansionism, we would say, in the South China Sea. You see China putting pressure again in the East China Sea. So there is a strategic logic uh, where the two uh, environments are connected. And you also see 
an ongoing uh, battle for the hearts and minds, also here in the UK. You might know, but it was only recent news, but the Sunday Times made a scoop of a uh, local think tank that was paid 10,000, uh, maybe it is still, paid uh, 10,000 uh, pounds per month by the Japanese uh, embassy in London. Also, to have editorials written by this think tank, but signed by authoritative proxies, such as former Foreign, Se foreign Secretary Rifkin, or uh, a former uh, uh, admiral, uh, I don't remember his name, that were, of course, just asked to sign these uh, editorials uh, denouncing China, <clears throat> not necessarily on the Sinkapudio dis dispute, but on Chinese links uh, and Chinese activities in the UK, such as in, in Hinkley Point, and, and getting a fee for this. And this is propaganda. Also, you could say in the more manipulative uh, sense, because you don't see, if it weren't for the scoop, or you don't see the government's hand playing a role. And of course, in, uh, as, China, as Japan pushes uh, for strategic port codes in the South China Sea, which is still a relatively minor uh, <coughs> uh, initiative, China has been pushing, again, for an antagonistic uh, message towards Japan. And even if you have something such as this one, the commemorative pictures are still very uh, uh, emasculated. Well, they are neutralized because you don't see the national flags. And so China has, uh, uh, you know, the Chinese government has made use of this antagonistic uh, narrative, spe specifically against Abe, it has uh, demonized, if you want, the Abe government. And now, in order to have a working relationship to Abe, with Abe, it needs to, to be very careful uh, where, uh, where it walks, not least because uh, more hawkish factions could jump at Xi Jinping uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and label him as uh, as uh, <clears throat> as weak vis-a-vis -vis a demonized uh, Japan. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.